Very good to introduce to Astronomy to I. And I would like Dr. Prakash to uh, take over from the lecture. Your job will be Right. 
right? We know that we live in this observable universe. So the universe is probably extending all the way to infinity. I mean, it's probably infinitely large. We see only a fraction of it, but we have an understanding from your standard models of big bang theory and all that. We know what is beyond there. We have some idea of what is beyond there. But one could ask, like, before the big bang, what it was, what, what was there, and if there, there is something beyond the extent of the universe as we know. Those things are right up there. But one fundamental thing is for me uh, about intelligent life. Right? Life itself is interesting if you think about it, that it exists on other planets. But uh, it would be very exciting to know. And I have thought about it quite a bit. And my question would be where is the nearest intelligent being? Intelligent defined as human or it's not like I'm not interested in anything lower. It's just I mean, as humans, we want to know whether we have somebody with whom we can have as equal a intellectual conversation as we have with each other from our own species. Because even if we drop a little bit to the apes, we know that we are not good at communicating with them. So it's good to know. And I, I would make it such a, a, you know, a point of view of where it is. So the answer is something that we can work on rather than asking if they are. Because the answer to if could be yes or no. And you wouldn't know whether it's very rare or it's, it's very common and so on. So the nearest one would be interesting to know. We have absolutely no idea what the answer for this could be. But exoplanets uh, really price, it's essentially the first step to take in trying to answer that question. For that reason, even if I've never worked on this, I'm extremely interested in this question. So for today's talk, I'll uh, cover essentially four different topics. Uh, the introduction, where, I mean, if I'm going to be talking for more than an hour about, about planets, it's good to know what exactly I mean by that. And as you will see soon, that it's not very really straightforward. Everybody might think that, oh, show me some object, I'll identify it as a planet or not. But it's not that obvious, especially if you bring in the hosts of planetary bodies that we observe outside of us. So the other thing would be obviously you want to know the physics of how we go about finding this. So that is where a lot of efforts are uh, directed towards, and you would like to know how exactly we came about. And it's a very recent field in terms of detecting them. It has been up only in the last few decades before that we had no idea. Even some of the uh, uh, finding planets in our solar system has come about much much recently, relatively recently, the last century or so. Uh, after that, we'll, of course, take the next step and talk about habitability. Now, this is something, uh, again, as we go uh, go forward and try to answer more, more and more complex questions about life, it becomes we become less and less uh, knowledgeable to, to getting to the answer there because of inherent uh, difficulties in trying to observe these systems and trying to come up with theories that are uh, enough to know about things like habitability. So we can talk about it, we can discuss the basic ideas that compared to the detection of science, we notice that our understanding of habitability is quite uh, primitive. And then it's always good to see because we have over 5,000, I think the last uh, round number was 5,500 planets that have been performed. Which means that there are some crazy, fantastic uh, planets that are out there that we would like to know. And it's just, you know, it's impressive you know, to think about them and it's exciting for them. So we will take a look at a few of those to get it done. And also, sometimes they tend to go a bit slow because of its patterns. We'll see how far we get. This talk uh, this itself, you can probably get it. So, uh, if you if you using this link, you'll be able to get get this slide for it. So it's not that why that that your plan is to be So the reason I actually did not go working on exoplanets is because if you, when you start learning physics and you are impressed by the theories that we have developed to explain our more complex phenomena, you realize that you want to be in a field where you can look at extremes of physics. 
And that is one thing that the planet cannot achieve right now offer, and it's very unlikely it will offer in the near future. Because all you need is pretty much uh, celestial mechanics, the motion of bodies and all that. And if you're really interested in physically and all that, you're talking about energies at the time scale that we seek of the energy scales that we are interested in are the ones of everyday life. And that is something we are aware of here. And we do a lot of planets and we're really trying to choose that frontier forward to the extremes and so on. The, so the, the feet itself, you may, you may have to use quite simple. I mean, it may take complex forms in terms of how many parameters uh, it takes or, um, or to, the, to the level at which you can constrain various models. But in terms of how much physics you can, how much new physics you can discover from it, it's pretty difficult. That is one of the reasons I would want to concentrate on things where it increases your broad physics knowledge. But then this is something whenever I get the time, I try to understand it. And then it comes to the ultimate question in the universe, it's the top most part. Okay, I'll start with something simple before we define planets is defining, you know, a star. What is the closest star to the planet? To our planet? Everybody knows, you know, at this point, the sun. I was, I was uh, surprised, but, I mean, I take it for granted too, because this is something everybody does in their school. But and you take it for granted, and you are actually shocked and surprised if somebody does not know that fact. I did encounter from time to time undergraduate students when I was a TA, who, with, to whom if I say that, they would be really surprised by it. And I realized that that is a more natural state of thing rather than expecting it to be true. Because most of us, if I'm not wrong, we, we know that it's the closest star because we read it somewhere, not because we did For instance, you can ask yourself, how can you convince somebody else that this is a star? Or did you do some experiment or did you try to de deduce by some chain of reasoning to decide that the sun is a star? And you'll see that most of us, we just read it and we read it so early on while reading things about science and the world around us that we, we think that's what. We are so sure that that, is, that makes sense. But a lot of things, even if you go to early Renaissance period, you'll see that people struggle with these ideas. And there was no way to know the, the truth about it. I tried to find out what are the what were some of the earliest sort of physics uh, motivated ideas of stars, and there are very few. It, the ideas came up much later, and people had this fantastical view, this some fantasy based views of what the stars could be. And uh, that is, I mean, that makes sense that this be very contemplative idea because the day is very different than the night sky where you see all the stars. In the daytime, you see the sun. Now, even a little change in our environmental conditions, you would see that it would have been a lot more intuitive, a lot far back in time, that the sun is the star. And that is if we did not have an atmosphere. So this is a simulated view on Scandinavian, where I think the pointer, if I try to use the laser pointer, it just reloads. Sorry, I think I'll need one of these bands. So uh, this is just to show that even the concept of you know defining a star 
or understanding what a star is not the uh, most not the most intuitive and uh, the very well recorded uh, <coughs> of the sun being a star comes in the 1800s by the measurements of Bessel who measured the distance to some of the stars uh, using parallax and then one can record the brightness of it and since you know the distance to the star, you know the distance to the sun, you just imagine bringing this, that distance down to the distance of the sun. And you notice that they are not very different in terms of functions or brightness. So that is that is one of the uh, possibly one of the only ways you could you could tell uh, you could prove that the uh, sun is the star. Now if you think about how far back you could use to expect planets around stars. Since the definition of star, uh, identifying star as a, the sun as a star and stars as these suns itself is relatively great. You can imagine that before that, if there people had no reason to believe that there, these planets that they see going around the sun uh, would be found around these tiny specks of light as well. But once uh, the speculations of distant stars star came similar to the sun, might have preceded the 1800s, obviously. At that point, people would have start, already started assuming that these stars would have planets around them. So that's a fair guess. But uh, the real technology of uh, finding these planets happens to be available only in the last 40 years. So we discussed what the idea of planets are. Now, But that just defines what exo means. It doesn't define what a planet is. Because we just assume, oh, I can identify planets. We put a row of things like this. We know which one of planets, which one of Right? At least because in the solar system, again, we have, we have been told what is what. That is the So if I show some picture like that, even though there is a distribution of these masses, somewhat, you know, many of them very close by. You will know how to how to say that this is a planet and this is not. This is not. Even something that is bigger than a planet is not a planet. But then you realize that what is the definition of planet? Because if I give a if I show you a body without giving it a name, you won't be able to tell, right? Whether it's a moon or a planet. Okay, so I was just going to ask you so. How can you define, let's say we go about defining it. There are a few criteria that you define. You've already read one. <laughs> okay. That is the easy one anyway. I expected everybody to get that. So how would you define a planet? The first thing you would say is? Revolving around the sun. Yes, that's good. That's how, do, how does that help? It excludes the moons. There are moons as I showed you, there are moons of the that are bigger than one bit. And you would want to exclude this. We'll come to why you would want to exclude those. But then I show you a bunch of objects that are going around the sun, which are not that kind. Uh, so then what would you say? That's a bit high. Is this for the, is the black one for the laser? laser? Oh, okay. Huh. So I show you these, these two are on the sun as well. And how would you modify it so that you can do these here? One needs to be on that. Size. What do you say about the size? I mean, we already saw that size is a problem. Because if you say size, then which one can do it, which one can not. Of course, you can hierarchically go and say that anything that is bigger than one you know, bigger or equal to one baby, but then it's a bit arbitrary. You may find a planet that is out there uh, much farther away from you know, orbit of Neptune, which we haven't looked at. It may be smaller than one of those, which is not part of the planet. Time for I think you could find that there are things in the uh, in the like type of for instance or asteroid belt that have all essentially lost the period. orbit uh, do not cross other planets orbit. I don't I think you can have there could be systems where they are big enough and they do cross. But that is not one. Look at the shape. 
So you have the medium, and that depends a lot for him uh, with the masses. So you have enough mass to have uh, six for being Jupiter mass, then you'll have the medium burning, and they emit their own light because of that one. So anything lower, you can set a upper limit like that, and you can have uh, an extra thing that you need not apply to our solar system because we don't see the objects. But up to 13 different masses, we can accept that. So the next thing is not very intuitive. You can see that it is something you know, experts, astronomers have decided how it is definition. And this is where I said the definitions are particularly so that we can view all these objects in terms of how they form, in terms of planet formation rates. So the last one says that we exclude objects such that the host object, the ratio of host object mass to the object that's, that's sort of revolving around it, or in this case, there's some sort of minute that are going around there. If the mass ratios are uh, you know, less than 1 over 25, that is, uh, the host star is less than 25 times the, the other uh, object that they're calling as a planet, then we won't call it as a planet. Anymore. The reason for that is then the way the planet formation works is that we form a star, a protostar in, in the beginning. There is a disk of material that is there, and the planets only form in that disk over time. But if the mass discrepancy is very small, then they sort of go evolve to become these what they call it as you know, host star or planet body and so on. So we have some mass discrepancy that is that low that they uh, a very heavy brown dwarf and a sort of lighter, very close to 13 Jupiter masses or so, then we know that the mass difference is so let's say something like 12 Jupiter mass and 15 Jupiter mass, if there are two objects like this we see in the system, then we know that it's not that the 15 Jupiter mass object forms first and it had a protoplanetary disk and that planet formed, but very likely both of them had equal division of the initial matter and they sort of develop uh, equivalent uh, more matter and develop into these objects pretty simultaneously. So from that definition, they bring, bring this. And the 1 over 25 comes from uh, the same, uh, defining the Lagrange points for the ordinary body. You must have heard about uh, Lagrange points, right? Um, that there are two bodies, there are these five points where the potential has the extrema. So, there's L1 and L3, which are sort of unstable equilibrium, but still will get on the saddle point on which, uh, you know, like uh, there is equilibrium, but it's sort of unstable. But there are these points L4 and L5 as well, uh, if you want to draw it. <laughs> Thank you. 
finding whatever they feel like in the past, as a planner, you know, finding it in the beginning of the paper and writing about it. We have these agreed upon things. Communication is key. That's why we are such a successful or uh, in some successful species that we we do things precisely and we communicate to each other. So if we define things very precisely about what a planet is, then we can learn think better about it, can communicate those ideas better about it. And that's a big important. Scientifically, uh, I mean, you should uh, think from a physics perspective. Then, as I said, this is about trying to follow a path of how these planets are formed and evolved. If you define it in a certain way, if you identify uh, systems that satisfy the criteria, you will see that you can study its evolution much better. If you consider pretty much anything that is going around the pond, other than a star in that system, then you will have trouble in explaining how each of these points. Every one of them might diverge at various points uh, as to how they evolve. Right? So that's why it's kind of So uh, we'll move to the next one now. So you saw that we have, uh, we try to define very well right now for the other star. Next is going and trying to understand how how do we went about discovering these things? So uh, we, we, we discussed how the definition of stars came about and the identification of stars as similar to the sun. Now, uh, binary stars have been studied for a very long time. I was in the 1800s when they started some form to various levels of uh, uh, precision. <laughs> And there is a reason for that binary stars are relatively easier to study. And I mean, it's quite intuitive. You can see how, for the fact that everybody must have looked at this, looked at this picture on the online, there, it gives a model of the size of the planets at the bottom. Right? But in binary stars, you know that it's easier because the stars are relatively, you know, uh, in terms, if you compare just the masses, they are on similar time. So what you would expect is, if three stars are in the binary, you would expect the effect of one star on the other to be higher than, let's say, the effect of any planets on the star. So uh, I would assume that many of you have heard or know the basics of what the planets are, or planet detection and all that. Is anybody who's competing with the idea? Because I might just assume some things that we know that uh, planet detection methods depend on the effect of the planet on the sun, on, on the star rather than the planet itself. Okay, then I'll try to make sure I, I spell those things out. So uh, when we think about planet detection methods, uh, you, uh, the fundamental idea is, as I show the frequency in the masses of and time span of the we cannot easily look at the planet itself. For one thing, it doesn't produce its own energy. Right. Other thing is, uh, the star is always going to be brighter and more visible for obvious reasons than the planet. So what one goes for is the effect of the planets on the host star, rather than the, uh, rather than the planet itself. Except for a, a, a couple of exceptions, obviously. But as a technology, uh, technology to look at stars we have developed over a much longer time scale. And we have improved it, the improved the precision of it over time significantly, which means that uh, we can rely on that to begin with. And in the future, obviously, we may not have to uh, resort to just looking at the stars. But let's say we have a stellar binary, which we have been looking on for you know, over 100 years. Here, the mass difference is not very very high, then you will see that the effect on the on, on the stars are somewhat equal. If there is no mass difference, they are equal in terms of how much one object pulls the other. Or just looking at how how much yeah. the, uh, one object displaces the other from uh, a sort of static uh, configuration, mm -hmm. you will see that they are equal and they are quite nuanced. If you uh, slowly try to increase the mass density. You'll notice that the smaller object will have a bigger effect on its dynamics due to the massive object. That's again intuitive. 
and the smaller, uh, the bigger object will slowly, the effect that the smaller object now has on the bigger object slowly reduces. Now, this is for instance a typical mass difference on the planet and the moon. And you can see that the planet does get affected by the moon system for the of the planet. But if you have something like a star and a planet system, a typical mass difference like this, you can see that the uh, the star itself is very little. The effect of the planet on the star is much lower. Mm -hmm. And that fundamentally uh, decides how well we can check these things. Okay. So uh, one can have systems of any orientation in space, obviously they're not on either space. So you do have systems with all orientation. And this we would call the edge on view. And this we would call a case on view. Again, the names are that's what it is. Uh, there are three, uh, I mean, there are about five of detection methods we'll go into. Uh, the, the three of those that I feel are the most important to look into. Uh, the first one is the linear velocity method, because this has been uh, the most useful to begin with. So uh, the first detections have been using, using the linear velocity method. Then we will look into the most prolific method, which has produced a lot more detected, lot more planets than the radial velocity method. And the third one, even though it, it hasn't uh, hit us by a lot of planets, it's the most visceral one that it's just incredible to see that we can detect planets like that. So the radial velocity method is fairly simple, it's not very different than how we used to study binary stars. The binary stars we study using, oftentimes we cannot resolve them, or most of the time we cannot resolve the binary stars unless they are what are called wide minor. What you see is, uh, when you cannot resolve it, all you can see is the light from it and the spectrum that you can use. Uh, people understand what a spectrum is, right? How the, uh, the power is distributed at a top of it. Right? This is where you will see the continuum emission from that body for most of the stars. And there will be lines of absorption, or uh, in rare cases, emission that you can see due to uh, atomic combinations. Now, if you have that, the binary is how there's some class of objects called spectroscopic binaries. The way you dissociate two objects that are going around each other. And look at a spectrum, you get only one spectrum because you cannot resolve the object. But you'll see systematically things moving back and forth. For instance, the, uh, the, the, the absorption. And the reason for that is the Doppler effect of light where anything that is uh, uh, emitting body that is coming towards you will have its radiation frequencies blue shifted and the ones that are going uh, uh, away from you will have the radiation the continuum and the uh, absorption uh, lines uh, move towards the red red or low end. So this is simple. Uh, the idea is also very intuitive that is thinking about the wave nature of light you have subsequent threats of uh, light if you just assume a one chromatic ray that is being emitted and the object is moving towards you, then every subsequent press uh, is you know closer by compared to if it was emitted from a from a constant distance. So what that means is So this 
this is where you can see that you will have continuous spectrum, but continuous spectrum you cannot easily tell whether things are getting redshifted or reshifted. We have these lines which inevitably you do for uh, stars. Then you can see that there are systematic changes to it, and that's how you do it. And the equation would go something like this where you can more easily find the mass because you can measure, the, you can sort of guess the mass of the star from what sort of spectral lines it has. And you know the classic based system from which is the main sequence star, what that is going to be. And you'll, uh, you can get the V star. And uh, from that, you'll have the degeneracy of the mass and the velocity of, of the thing. But uh, you can get the ratio then of the velocity of the, of the mass of the planet and the mass of the star. There will always be a, a, a sort of observational effect due to the inclination of the star. Uh, this method, for instance, is best applied if it's a job, then you have a very good guess of the mass. Obviously, if it's a uh, phase on, then phase on there will be almost no radial velocity for us to measure. But for very small inclination, there will be high uncertainties of the mass that we have. I inclination I guess. So the next question then you would think about when you learn about this technique is that how sensitive are our instruments and why you weren't be able to do that when you were doing observations of binary stars for instance. The next question is for something, our, for something like our planet uh, or our solar system, what is the sort of radial velocities that Jupiter or Earth will impart? So that is that Jupiter is going to have a velocity, uh, Jupiter is going to perturb the movement of the sun and that perturbation is going to be a velocity increase of about 12 meter per second over 12 years. That is, you know, as it goes around, around the sun, it, the velocity of the sun has the rate of velocity as we view it to, view it, to go from 0 to a maximum of 12 meters per second. Zero as in, I mean, it might have its own uh, uh, problem motion. But on top of that, due to the that I could be 30 meters. But the same thing you consider for Earth, you would expect it to be smaller, right? Because the Earth is much more, less massive than the planet. So even though it's close by, that it will be very small, it will be around 70 meters per second. These are very minuscule values. The important, one important thing to appreciate here is that we are not just looking at radial velocities, we are talking about the change in radial velocity over time. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is all stars we observe will have some or the other proper Our idea is to want to be able to tell the variation of that over time. Because the proper motion by, uh, or just a redshift of our blue shift by itself may not be due to over time. So, the, the lower our uncertainties of how well we can measure the radial velocity of the, of the star, the, that well we can uh, measure the variations over time, and then we can uh, deduce the variable facts. So in 1952, I think Otto Stroh, the uh, famous astronomer, we used to study about binaries, who uh, thought that it, it might be worthwhile looking for these uh, planets around other stars. But at that time, the best of the instruments had an uh, uncertainty of how many meters per second. So you could do a lot of binary uh, me measurements, but in, uh, you know, even something like a uh, massive Jupiter around the sun at that distance would be nearly really impossible, or highly impossible. By 1993, it was significant to reduce uncertainties to which you can measure the radio velocities, and it came down to 7 meters per second. And and that is why uh, 1995, uh, right? that is when they first found the first time. In 2003, it has come down to 30 meters per second, and right now the most advanced one can go up to a few centimeters per second, which means one can detect something like the Earth going around a star like our sun uh, at, at that distance as well. Uh, I'm sure you can appreciate with this uh, detection method that it's particularly, uh, it can detect particularly well ma more massive objects, uh, the planet, it can obviously measure better because the depth of the star will be more. But also the closer it is to the star, the more it will further the star. So distant one, the less massive one, 
Another method is astronomy, which, which helps us to look even at phase one systems or rather less suited for phase one systems. Because we are looking at a, again at the model of the star, but not spectroscopically, but just in the position in the star, I would say. For instance, we are looking at something phase on, and we see that the star is seems to be moving with respect to the nearby stars, then we know that something might be perturbing it. And if it's very systematic, then we can find these stars. Uh, then we know that some object is systematically going around it. Of course, things are complicated. This is a simple picture. The first one, when I talk about detection methods, I'm concentrating on just two bodies, right? If there are multiple planets around it, then it becomes fun. For instance, this is a picture of, uh, yeah, this is a schematic model of where the baby center of the solar system lies over time. What is the baby center? If we have a system or a distribution of masses, the center of mass about which everything else seems to relatively move around it is the baby center. And this yellow disk shows the extent of the sun. And you can see that due to the collective effects of all the you know, gas giants, all the planets, it's not one point in the solar system, that point keeps changing because the position, the relative position of the planets keeps changing. Which means that earlier, you know, this is from 1945, somewhere here. There are times when the baby center is inside the sun, which means the sun moves much less. But if it's outside the sun, so essentially if you pick a point and you see a baby center at a particular year, that means that the sun will essentially go around this point. Mm -hmm. So you can see that at times it can have bigger moment, at times it can be lower than it. And when I talk about these detection methods, also it may sound, many of them may sound simple because of multiple planets. Then you have a problem. 
where you can see that it can only do a small range of achievement. But when it does, then what you have is reduction in the right of the star. You can imagine the complexity with this. First of all, the star itself is variable, or uh, variable in the sense this it can have regular statistical variability where it won't always be exact constant number, there will be detection uh, uncertainties as well. And just regular stochastic processes that are causing some sort of intrinsic variability in the right of the star. And hence we will be able to detect only the planets which are able to cause changes beyond this intrinsic variability. So for instance over here the standard L over L is and the stand for luminosity and the relative change in luminosity over time. And fundamentally this is what I'm going to do. This is a schematic which shows uh, more details of how one would see it. Uh, it's not, it's quantitatively correct in the sense that there are times you would see a big depth, there are times you would see a slowly increasing function, a smaller depth and a decreasing function. Why people understand the reasons for this? So, this one is obvious, right? This one is obvious because you're covering the right region of the star and the bigger step. Now, what? Uh, why is it slowly increasing? Excuse me. No, it's not. This is not spectroscopy. It's just you're looking at brightness, how bright it is, and you suddenly see that in the so this has bad correspondence with the No, no. So this is the light of the star. Okay. It's the light of the system. Without looking ultra away. This is the light, total light coming from the system, and mostly this is the star, right? Just not generate light. The idea is it does reflect light. So that's where the answer now. Can you tell now why it's only increasing? The light is coming from both star and planet. Yes, planet because of reflection. <laughs> and why is changing over time? Because of phases, right? So you can imagine that if the planet is in this part of the orbit, you will see just a crescent of it. And if it's somewhere in here, you will see half of it. As it goes beyond the star, that you will see the entire phase of the planet is there. And that is the reason there is a dip here as well, where the light from the reflected part is lost. Right? And this is something we see in our inner planets too. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but if you see Venus, if you see it through a telescope, over time you will see it having phases just like our moon. You won't always see, like, if you see it in the sky, you might just see a bright you know, star like object. But if you try to see uh, a magnified image of it, you will see always see your face. Now again, this one can be complicated if you have multiple planets going around it. A uh, light curve will look something like this, where there will be multiple degrees, degrees, and so on. And then you'll have to figure out by problem working, you'll have to figure out how many planets are there and what size. Here you will appreciate that you won't easily get the masses on top. You'll get the radii of the planets because that's the information we have, how much is the time. So again, you can ask for our planetary system, what is the expected amount of dimming one can see here. Uh, alien rays looking at our sun trying to apply this method. We'll see that the digital causes about 1% decrease in the uh, brightness of the sun. And if they want to detect Earth, there are uncertainty seems to be much higher. The reduction in the dry force is very small from zero to zero. So the third one is the one I call the most difficult to look at because we are actually looking at a planet that is very visible, which is direct to it. There have been very few of them that have been done uh, using this method. And you can again imagine the planets that they find using this may not all be that exciting to us. One, they tend to be very far from the hot star. The idea is we'll try to block out all the light that is coming from the hot star and we'll try to look at the reflected light from the planet that is going. 
and you can imagine it, uh, it works very well. Uh, I, could, I guess it could work for uh, phase one and phase one plans. But depending on the orientation, there will be a phase, and there might be some times where you will get open affected by it, and sometimes you will get phase. Mm -hmm. But of course, I think this is one of the first ones that were done. The, uh, the planet was much bigger than I am, or 4.7 times more massive than the data, and it had a very large orbit. What is the orbital distance of Jupiter? Approximately. What is the orbital radius of Jupiter? So, what 5 AU? So, compared to that, you can imagine two hundred and twenty, sixty 260 AU is really, really far away. But if you want to block all the light using a coronagraph, if it is just local to your uh, uh, telescope, you put something to block all the light from the star coming into your mirrors, and then you try to image only the things a little far away. So you can imagine your sensitive to only that. So this is an example of how over the course of uh, long period of observation, you can even detect multiple planets, those ones farther away, and this is how you block out the light, and they're not of very advanced. completely rule out the light coming directly from the stars. The other one is micro lensing. It's also used, but again, compared to the first two, the radial velocity and the counter method, uh, this one, the contribution on number of planets is detected in this is quite small. The idea is essentially that whenever there is a really two objects here, one is the sun and the planetary system which form, which, uh, which acts as a lens, a gravitational lens. Uh, probably many of you are not uh, familiar with the idea. So gravity, because of general relativity, we see that uh, massive objects tend to distort space around them, you know, space time technically. But the space itself has a curvature because of that. Which means that anything in the absence of mass, if it was going in a particular direction, will be bent towards the massive object when a massive object is present in that along the line of um, um, the line of that. So what that means is, and this is something that happens on either side of the lens. So what you will see is there will be momentary enhancement of uh, brightness of the background object due to this passing lens. It just so happens that usually you need a mass to be of the, uh, you know, like the mass of the stars for you to detect it very easily. But on top of that, if you have a planet, what you'll have is a increase in brightness, but also a secondary little blip on top, where because there's a planet that then it also distorts space time around it and combines the combined effect of the planet as a uh, host star. And that will all, that is another way of detecting it. But these tend to be, you know, very you have to have a chance, for instance, of a background star and a lens, and this would be something that is non free because the planet, the, planet uh, the lens system is not going around that other star, but it just happens to be there for a very short period of time. So these are the, the main ways of uh, looking at planets, radial velocity. So the, I think this slide is. Only very slightly out of date, but that is bound to happen because every year, uh, every few months, the number of planets that we detect are confirmed in the of substantially hundreds by hundreds. But radial velocity, we have discovered about 1,000 planets also, a little over 1,000. But transit method has given four, factor of four higher number of planets, about 4,000. Direct imaging, about 52 planets, you can see why it's hard and it's not easy to find those. Gravitational lensing about 148, astrometry only two. So uh, the most prolific of these, which is the transit method, what you were, I mean, there are dedicated missions for it. The most famous one that increased the number of detected planets by huge number is uh, Kepler. Many of you at least would have heard about him. So the idea was to just look at a patch of the sky where there are, you know, star forming regions. Ideally in the this galaxy, because there are many stars over there. And just continuously look uh, for a very long period of time, over years. 
And that is again something you can uh, appreciate because even if, if you are looking for something like a going on front, you need at least a few transits for you to know whether to know for sure what the period is. And since the orbital period of Earth is one year, you need to make that observation at least for the four years. Anything that is closer by, you can detect it in a year. It will have multiple orbits around it. But the farther away, the smaller it is, and all that you need to make longer than it is. This over here shows in which direction one is looking at the Kepler's Earth space, so to say. All the stars that you are looking at are not distributed in one small region, but you are looking at all stars, all stars in this corner of the region, along this horizon star. So this is how it would look, and you just constantly look at it, and then you get light curves, which are just brightnesses and function of time, and wherever there are depths, you will manage to model it and try to find it. What the star system are. Uh, after the success of uh, Kepler, it is now S, which has much larger coverage. It tries to pretty much look at all directions uh, at various cadences. Cadences means how frequently you go there and observe, and what is the net amount of time you observe that you are using. The colors indicate essentially that some regions it will look for you know, uh, uh, 351 days, some of them much lower. And if you get a little bit you might find some candidate sources, then there will be follow-ups that can be done with other types of things. So usually in astronomy, that is what happens. There are dedicated missions, there are surveys, both of them. And surveys have their own users who so can scan a much larger area of the sky, get a lot more system, and then follow up if we find the data. So the next is what makes us this is time plan and time period. Are we over time or no? But if anybody has something they would rather be doing it or that it could be, I won't mind at all. Consider this as over time. If you understood half of things or some of the things that I explained so far, good. Okay. So you see some of your old sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, people who do not, who haven't been in touch with astronomy much, the stars themselves, we have a classification scheme for things, and then scientists, uh, scientists like to do that classification and designing and all that. Astronomers more so, they, they try to do it so much that if you are a person like me who, who does not like remembering a lot of facts, oh, who cannot remember a lot of facts, numbers and all that, you always find it hard. But there is a classification system that exists for stars. So, so like, the, the reminder again, stars are what <coughs> are bodies that burn, uh, have nuclear fusion of hydrogen at some point in their life. And when they are burning actively hydrogen, it takes uh, that part constitutes the biggest phase of their life, and therefore the main season stars. And those things, you can classify them according to the spectra they have. And from that you can deduce a lot of pretty much everything about the star because our uh, you know our understanding of stellar evolution is pretty much you know, very very well known. Uh, the physics that goes into it, the nuclear reactions, the radiation transport, and everything. Mm -hmm. Then we can tell the mass with pretty good certainty, the radius, the lifetime, pretty much everything about the star. So you have these stars from N to O and KG and KG. These here, the schematic shows the relative sort of sizes. The size increases drastically, going from N to O. And uh, you can imagine the losses also are things like that. It may not always be proportional, and usually it does not tend to be proportional. But you can know that the M star was the smallest in size, the least massive. And what will be our less intuitive is that. The, the n type stars will live the longest, and the bigger the star, the faster they are. Because they are able to more efficiently, they beat the lot of hydrogen that is available on the board. So, this table over here sort of gives you know, the distribution of such uh, type of classes from n to o. How the Luminar speed increased by orders of magnitude, not just a linear scale, and the lifetimes, how they decrease 
many more such smaller regular analysis, uh, again by order of magnitude, like four orders of magnitude. Why is this important? Is that if we are going to talk about planet habitability, obviously you are interested in uh, life. Whether you can find some form of life around the star in one of life. Which means it's important to know what the time scale is on, because the time scale will not be enough for life to develop. Now how do we get to these? These again have huge uncertainties, and the definition of life itself then comes into question, how do we define it? We try to do our best, which is go by what we are familiar with, which is just the life on the planet Earth. Carbon based, water dependent, and so on. There are people who work on defining it more broadly or trying to explore whether you can define life uh, more broadly. The they can define that I'm not primarily carbon based. Uh, of course, that is important, and I'm sure in the future it will be quite important to use those definitions to look for life. But uh, similarly, to have only to, uh, only to us to go on to decide how long it takes for life to end up on the planet. And you'll notice that complex life is life is there. The life itself doesn't seem to be that rare if you go just by uh, our history of planet Earth. That is, it took less than a billion years, pretty much half, uh, half a billion years for the time to originate on planet Earth. But something complex like animals, it took, you know, nearly four billion years for for such uh, for the life they evolved in history. So when we are interested in searching for certain kinds of planets and their activity, then we have to keep that in mind and you can choose to define it. Then you can, you can exclude you know, uh, these stars, which live less than a billion years in the main sequence. After that, they become very giant. If they had any planets around them, they are close by, they will just gobble them up. Yeah, the distance once there will be huge uh, changes in the velocity or energy that they, that they get, so they may not be conducive for life. It so happens that one has not found a lot of uh, planets around very massive stars. One, it could be just the mass difference is so high that our, we don't have the sensitivity, or, and, or the second thing is it could be so bright that you know, the techniques we are not able to tell the resolution of planets. But it could just be that something in the formation of the planets not conducive for the sort of planets that are forming around uh, uh, stars in their early life is not enough to form this planet. The, the, each of these stars themselves have a lifespan, as I said, a stable lifespan, the longest lifespan is the main sequence, and they're they slowly burning hydrogen at a constant rate and they go really constant rate. But even our sun, they had, it had a birth, it, it formed, it came to the stable phase of nuclear burning, where the changes to the luminosity and the radius were quite small. But eventually, if you take that hydrogen, it will become much more bigger for an FBI, eventually, even going beyond the orbit of Mercury, possibly even the Earth. And there are huge winds that will be make the outer planets also lose their energy and the momentum and just fall into the stars and then end its life at the point one. So uh, the most basic idea of trying to define habitability is, as I said, if you go for carbon based life forms depending on water, you would want liquid water to be available for So it happens to be a good solvent and this is required for the reactions to happen. So you would just say that the closer you get to a particular star, it's going to get hotter, that you won't have uh, enough of it with water. And the farther away you go from it, which is again a problem because much of the water will condense into ice, and then again it's not going to be So you want it just right. This is the quantitative way of looking at it. The uh, more, uh, if you want to define a habitable zone, what first you need to define is the effective temperature on the surface of a planet. The way you would do it is that you would first uh, ignore atmosphere or any clouds or reflectivity. You would say that the reflectivity is essentially zero for a planet, which is uh, the term for albedo, which defines what fraction of the light that is falling on it is reflected versus absorbed. 
So if you assume that everything gets absorbed, right? all the uh, energy that is falling on a planet, now that is the of distance and the total velocity available. So the closer there is, you will see that it has higher flux. As you take the planet further away, the amount of flux because the solid angle of that planet reduces uh, compared to the center. And you will see that the flux is lower. Now all this energy goes into the surface temperature, then we will have equilibrium temperature that you can define. Now, but then you are interested in planets which may have an atmosphere, and many of them terrestrial planets they, they can have depending on their data. So what uh, and there are two aspects of it. You have the surface temperature that you have defined. That is something you can calculate just by knowing the luminosity of a star and distance at which you want to find out what the temperature is, right? And the size of the planet is. But then once you put in the atmosphere, we see that uh, for Earth, for instance, the most of the heating effect of, uh, of uh, the, surface, the surface temperature of the temperature in the atmosphere is due to uh, water vapor and carbon dioxide. And uh, there's a very little bit of due to the chain and so on. But the idea is in, in a place where, uh, in, a, in a planet where the atmosphere is important, there will be certain energy that is uh, uh, falling on the planet to the atmosphere. Only a certain amount is, is reprocessed and then emitted in a different, totally different energy. Which means it can attain slightly higher temperature than what we would estimate by assuming albedo to be zero. So that the way uh, then the way you could define it because of the importance of water vapor and carbon dioxide. You, you would find the outer edge of the habitable zone using where the temperature falls low enough that you don't have the carbon dioxide as a gaseous form in the atmosphere. So using that mark, which is at the edge of the habitable zone, for instance here, what happens is it condenses the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and reduces so that it, becomes, it is locked up as ice and the poles. So you don't have this heating capacity for your unit. What happens is that you can come very close, uh, there will be a lot more water vapor than liquid water, and eventually it will go into a, a, a runaway greenhouse effect where the temperature will be so high that you know, water vapor will be dissociated and lost in place. So that is essentially what happened to the Mars and Venus as well. This is very hot and atmospheric atmosphere, but almost no water. All the water vapor, not Here it's a very thin atmosphere, not enough uh, water vapor or water vapor in the common dioxide in the atmosphere to keep it. And in the end, uh, you, you, have, you can expect to get more energy. But as long as there's this criteria of sufficient atmosphere, uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor to So do you know, uh, does anyone know the average temperature of uh, on Earth? What is the sort of the average temperature we have? <laughs> what's the best? What's the best guess? <laughs> what's the best guess? 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 What's the best so it's about 15 degrees, and that's the effect of carbon dioxide and water. So, but let's say if it did not have atmosphere, can you guess how much it would it would be? Because 
say a lifetime from a scholar, so we give them more chance of writing than last. So if we have a star that is half the size of the star, you see that that is much longer. But the habitable zone gets uh, shrunk to much smaller distances. It, uh, it is half the size of the sun, then it's even within the uh, orbit of the closest. But still, the conditions of habitability can be satisfied over there. There might be other changes that you can imagine, like the period will be very, very low, which means that we may not have had the defined seasons that we have. But we could do all the ten years. The Similarly, the next stages of the sun, when it expands, it might expand close to the orbit of uh, uh, Mercury over there. Then the actual zone again, as you would imagine, as it gets bigger, the luminosity increases, although the temperature increases, the luminosity will increase because the cold will pass through it. And then the habitability zone will be pushed forward. Uh, system, there could be a moon 
because the way how to define modes, that could be comparable to the sign of the other one. This is how the light flow and work for the system, and one can go into details of how we can use it. This one is a planet with a bluish hue. You look at it on a dark blue. We have a planet that is drawn with a bluish hue. But this is even it's an artist. All these images that are displayed are the artist's conceptions. We are we do not have the ability to photograph them with this resolution. Again, this is due to the sort of material that we have to Now there are some very interesting planets, Earth and planets of that. One of uh, you know, uh, some of them are this Kepler 62 in Kepler 62, which is Earth-like. They they have Earth-like uh, periods as well, about a year. They lie in the habitable zone. Uh, the habitable zone over there. <coughs> this is to scale, which means that this uh, you know 65 percent uh, brightness of the sun which means it's a less bright star, which means that the zone is much closer. They're probably all within the radius of uh, medium for example. But still, it's never the And the mass of the area is called super Anything sort of greater than two Earth masses or super Earth, they would be bigger than Earth. Uh, this is just a snowball of planet where it's it's a huge planet, but the density is so low, it's most likely snow and rock, mix of snow and uh, rock. There are planets that are impressive in the sense that they are most likely the ocean ones. They are entirely covered with oceans. This again, you make these with a by looking at, uh, you know, measuring the masters, radius, and having an idea of their density and the composition. Not directly, but indirectly from this part of the so this one, for instance, is expected to be about 2,000 kilometers of just ocean something in one There are other planets in one of these star systems. This is how it would look from that sort of planet. You can see multiple stars just like in sci fi Proxima Centauri, the nearest star, uh, star system, also has planets around it. This is how it could look from such a dungeon planet. The Trappist is one remarkable uh, star system, uh, planet system, where they have multiple planets in, very close by in the uh, habitable zone. And some of them are super Earth, some of them are Earth life, but they are just a lot of planets. You can imagine going or, you know, detecting the in the system. I think I'll, I'll end this here. It is a nice little video. Yeah, you might have seen this already. But it just imagines a reduced volume, although the background volume is from bouncing and it just imagines a future where we will be able to travel to all, just the solar system planets. So they are the uh, the artist has done very good CGI, put trying to work, you know, how uh, adventurers who are going to different places on planet Earth will see various things. It's not connected to any one system.
you want to do that, I can take some questions too. So that I don't keep you mad. Any questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah.